So thank you for inviting me. Today I will be talking about some of the work we have been doing in our groups over the uh, past few years. And um, we generally uh, deploy uh, outdoor and indoor networks of low cost sensors. And we also uh, collect uh, personal exposure measurements for health studies. We develop novel analytical methods uh, for the interpretation of the findings for uh, health and policy purposes. Um, initially, I wanted to present um, a, a few more projects, uh, but I decided to focus on two. Um, two projects uh, that they are our most recent work. The first one would look at the impacts of the first lockdown on air pollution levels in London. And the second one will hopefully convince you why personal monitoring is important for health studies. Um, they both involve a large number of, part of partners and they're highly multidisciplinary and they involve um, a, a range, a great range of disciplines, starting from atmospheric scientists, computer scientists, and all the way to building science. Um, I will start from um, uh, the for, from the fact that uh, air pollution is a, is an important environmental health risk. I think everybody is familiar with that. It is estimated that the cumulative effects of indoor and outdoor exposure result in 8 million premature deaths every year around the globe. And um, this does not even include the years of disability. Uh, it's not a new problem. It's been around since the ancient times. Uh, but one example I always like to bring up is the London smoke event in the 50s where you can see that an increase in a four, over four days, an increase in smoke and um, um, but gases polluted resulted in excessive deaths, which did not return back to baseline, even after the levels went down. And this is because health pollution can have lagged effects. Um, another thing that I would like to mention is that uh, the burden of air pollution is not equally distributed among countries, with the poorest and most vulnerable populations um, being the worst affected and, um, and basically being exposed to the highest levels of air pollution resulting to the highest number of deaths. Um, there are many pollutants uh, and um, that been associated with health effects. Two of the most serious is um, the NOx, uh, nitric oxides, and that's the sum of NO and NO2, and particulate matter. NOx is primarily emitted by cars and trucks because it's created by combustion at high temperatures. Um, there is um, convincing evidence to associate NO2 with um, an increase in the prevalence and incidence of asthma attacks in children, and also with respiratory and um, cardiovascular effects in older adults. Um, particulate matter can either be formed uh, uh, directly or indirectly in the atmosphere through complex processes. And it's a mixture of different chemicals. It can be solid or liquid. And I will, I will um, focus a little bit more on particles. Um, we normally classify them by size. I would be focusing on PM 2.5 in this presentation because the size is important in a few different ways. First of all, it determines how long a particle will stay suspended in the air and uh, how long it would travel, but it also gives us information on the chemical composition. So generally larger particles come from natural sources, smaller particles come from combustion, and emerging evidence um, indicates that these combustion particles are actually the more toxic 
which is unfortunate because they are also the ones that they uh, go deeper into the respiratory system and they can even reach on the alveoli and from there pass into the blood and harm every organ, the liver and even the unborn fetus. Um, because our pollution is such an important health uh, risk factor, governments around the world try to uh, put uh, limits on the, uh, of the exposure of the global population and they routinely uh, measure levels with um, uh, reference grade instrumentation. And while they are uh, very accurate, the main uh, limitation is that they are very expensive to set up and maintain and they require infrastructure. Uh, as a result, um, this, is a, this is a map I, I downloaded from open, open Air Quality. Um, the, the, you can see the discrepancy between developed and low and, and middle income countries where um, low, uh, like Western world is overrepresented and uh, has a much better infrastructure. For example, in London, we have the London Air Quality Network that has around a hundred of these instruments and it's one of the biggest and um, well-maintained networks around the world. However, even um, uh, so many um, so many sensors, like a hundred of them, are not adequate to capture the high variability of outdoor air pollution or the exposure of the population that constantly changes. And and most importantly, because um, we, there is there are no resources in in um, in in countries with lower income, they don't have the capability to deal with this certain environmental issue. Uh, with that in mind, we've been developing low-cost sensor platforms that they are very cost effective to deploy, uh, to deploy and maintain. And the, their main advantage is that they can be um, they can, they can be even they can increase the coverage both because we can create much denser outdoor or indoor networks, but we can also capture personal exposure, which wouldn't have been um, feasible in any other way. Um, here we have um, uh, an example of a personal monitor. I will talk more about that. And also they don't requ require power, so they can even be deployed in rural settings of the developed uh, world. Um, I'll start now with the first project. I'll talk about the Breathe London. Um, we deployed these sensors as the one shown on the top right. Uh, contract we, uh, corner. We, we deployed a hundred of them as shown in the map here and we expanded the existing network. And they measure everything that is uh, measured on a, a normal uh, reference station. And I would like to refer to two um, elements. I won't go into detail about that. I just want you to be aware of this. Uh, we, we, the first one is that uh, we collect data at, at fast, uh, we collect fast data. So we have one minute, normally a station gives you one hour resolution. And uh, that, that allows us to do scale separation. I also will not talk about that uh, right now about how we do that because it's a, it's a, it's a bit complex, uh, but this can enable us to do source apportionment. Secondly, we can collect CO2 measurements and while CO2 is not an important proxy for um, uh, uh, the outdoor CO2 is not a good proxy for health effects. It can still very, be very useful in the analysis of the data because this we can extract emission uh, indices. Um, shall I go on? Does, does someone want to ask something? I'll continue. Okay. So there are, I would mostly focus on the second outcome how we use modeling to do the data simulation. And, but before I, I jump onto that, I need to mention how we do the calibration. I mentioned earlier that there are concerns in the scientific community about the accuracy of such sensors. And many of you know that the way that we do the 
calibration is quite tedious and labor intensive. The first way is either to do it in the lab conditions or we can deploy them out, outdoors next to a reference instrument for a few weeks. So to overcome this, we, we came up with a new methodology that we can do this calibration automatically while we collect data. I won't talk about that, and I hope the publication will be out very soon. Uh, but this, this is, a, I think, is a game changer for these technologies. So moving now on, how we do the automatic interpretation. Uh, um, looking at the top, uh, the red line. This is the two months data a time series from last year, and the red line shows uh, where the measures came into force officially when it was announced that we should stay home. And uh, those are the knocks before and after. And just just eyeballing it, we don't see a big difference uh, uh, in the period before and the period after. So let's take a closer look and see why that happens. Those are data collected, by the way, with our network. We employ an ADMS model. So this is a, the ADMS model is a dispersion model that takes into account emissions and meteorology to um, output concentrations. And we see a reasonable agreement between the, the, uh, our, the ground observations and the black, and the, that is the output of the model until the lockdown. So now we're going to let the model run to do business as usual and see what happens. So the model has not been updated. It doesn't know that there's been a lockdown and everything changed. So it predicts what would have happened. And now we see that it doesn't agree anymore. Um, why does this happen? Um, uh, firstly, it explains why we didn't see an option and an obvious reduction because the meteorology is really important. And, and so, so like the effect of the meteorology masks the reduction that we should have seen. And what we learn from that is that uh, local interventions are effective in reducing uh, NOx. So if we, if, we, if we want to reduce this harmful pollutant in London, traffic rest restriction would indeed have an effect. So this is a natural experiment that we wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been possible to do otherwise. So let's go on the data assimilation. Um, and this, this slide is a bit complex, so bear with me. So what we did is we, we took the model and we started tweaking the emissions. The emissions are in purple. We started tweaking them until the, the concentrations that the model produces agree what, what, with what we measure. And we see here that um, um, uh, the reduction uh, before and after lockdown is only 15%. But if we now look at the emissions, the reduction in the emission is significant and it's in the, in the range of 85%. And uh, so it, it also teaches us an important lesson that if we want to evaluate the effectiveness of the interventions, we need to use this kind of smart analysis and we cannot just rely on the measured concentration levels um, because that this is not a good way to a good way to quantify the um, the intervention and uh, finally we uh, I look now in the in the same way I will look at the pm 2.5 levels um, and this is the levels before the lockdown and the levels after. And uh, what is quite, um, uh, sorry, uh, why it's quite unexpected is that um, there is an increase in the levels. So we do the same thing as we did before. We run the ADMS model and then we compare the model versus the, the measurements. And we see that there is actually no visible decrease despite the significant reduction in traffic. 
And that shows that most of the particles in London, they come from the far field. So they might, they might be coming from mainland Europe and therefore local interventions wouldn't be effective in, in controlling these harmful pollutants. If we wanted to tackle that, we would need, we would need to tackle it in the international level. To sum up, um, this is the first part of the of this uh, presentation and um, I, I showed how we can collect good quality data from networks by using an automated calibration method and secondly I showed how um, uh, by using a simulation of data we can extract valuable information from this um, data set and, and by quantifying uh, the different changes that we see we can guide policy. And uh, now I would move on to personal exposure. I would start from um, some uncertainties that, we, that are still uh, out there. And I would also include uh, some concepts so that the results that I present are a bit clearer. Uh, I've put um, some contour maps again from the ADMS model that I showed earlier that we used for the, um, uh, for, for the uh, uh, Breath London. And the scale starts from blue and goes to red. Uh, low is the, from lowest to highest. So um, you can see the, that London lights up and there are specific hotspots of exposure both for NO2 and PM2.5 because at this uh, time at these time scales and at these spatial concentrations these pollutants are highly correlated with each other. On the other hand ozone because of the chemical properties um, shows an anti-correlation with uh, so when NO2 is high ozone is low. This has important implications in health studies. Um, so this is a graph. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's, a, it's very common in health studies um, to quantify the effects of air pollution versus a specific, uh, a specific pollutant versus a specific outcome. And I will come back to this graph at, um, towards the end of the presentation because this has been produced with our data. So we use ambient levels versus a specific health effect. And we see that um, all gaseous pollutants, so they are produced by the same processes, they show a similar effect because they're correlated. We also see that NO2 and PM2.5 are highly correlated. And um, anything that's above the zero line, uh, it means that it's harmful to health. Um, so this high correlation between PM2.5 and uh, NO2 uh, has been a problem in health studies. And as the Committee of Medical Effects of Air Pollution has uh, stated, it's impossible to disentangle the effect of each one of these pollutants. On the other hand, ozone is below the zero line. So it shows that it has a beneficial effect for health or in other ways that breathing ozone is good for you. This is highly unlikely. And this is something that it is produced because of this anti-correlation that I talked about earlier. So someone who's living on the cleaner bit of London in the, in the peri-urban area would be exposed to higher uh, ozone concentration and lower pollutants and would therefore appear as if, the, as if ozone was the reason that they are better. Um, so all these all these correlations um, uh, when we use outdoor uh, measurements as proxies of exposures are the biggest limitation of epidemiological research and we cannot distinguish causal links. So with that in mind, we developed the personal air quality monitor. We call it the PAM and it's a um, it's a very small uh, platform with multiple sensors that they measure everything that a reference station would measure. It's very small. The participant can put it over their shoulder with a strap and walk about and get on with their daily lives. 
and um, all they have to do is just charge it at night and it would send data to our server through GPRS technology and we then further post-process this data. Um, it also collects activity um, parameters uh, like a GPS accelerometry and noise which help us um, develop a time activity model which I will expand also later on. Um, here is an example of uh, plotting GPS level uh, and NOx levels um, as the people go about their daily life. So we have GPS coordinates, we know where they've been exposed to what levels. And while it's not representative of the wider um, exposure, it is still gives us an idea of where maximum exposure happens during daily life, right? So walking on a busy street would result in high NOx levels. Um, the, the time activity model is important because as we walk down the street and we breathe in air, uh, it, how much air we breathe in would depend on how how physically active we are. So for example, a person running down a street would inhale more, more air and therefore would inhale a bigger dose of air pollution than a person walking down the same street that has lower physical activity levels. Um, the performance of the, of the pump has been excessively uh, validated. And if, if you want, you can look at the AMT um, uh, publication uh, in multiple configurations, outdoor, indoor, and in, um, uh, and, and in transit. Um, so we, we have, um, um, we need to understand what is the association between outdoor uh, measurements, indoor measurements and personal exposure. And the best way to do that is by employing a very simple mass balance model. And uh, as an illustrative example, I would show, um, um, I, I have simulated some data. So this is, uh, we start with the outdoor, we simulate uh, some outdoor levels. In the first case, we have an inert pollutant. That means it's not chemically reactive. So there are no losses. And whatever is outside, whatever is outdoor, um, reaches the indoor environment through ventilation, through intended and unintended openings. And then I simulated some sources uh, that they would, um, some irregular sources that um, that they simulate like what we do on our daily lives, smoking, cooking, cleaning, everything that in, introduces. Um, indoor um, air pollution. Uh, so the total exposure can be thought as what's generated outdoors plus what is generated indoors, right? And the outdoor, uh, so every source uh, would take some time to decay uh, to the outdoor levels and the rate of this decay depends on the ventilation rates of the specific building. So it depends on the building characteristics. So the second case we're looking now is a reactive pollutant. So that means once it comes inside, there are indoor processes like chemistry or um, deposition on surfaces that would take away some of the pollutant that comes from outside. It would get lost. Um, so, the, he, so this is what we would see. We would see generally lower levels than the one outdoors. And now I introduce the same sources as in this case, but this time the peaks are not as steep because some of it is lost. And also the decays are much faster um, because it, it's lost both due to ventilation as in case A, but also due to the indoor sinks. Um, so while it seems like a very simple um, concept, it is quite hard to model it in real life because 
a lot of the building characteristics, the materials, the location, the, um, how often the occupants open the windows and um, uh, what kind of sources they introduce, all of that, they introduce great uncertainty. And as an example, I, I, I'm going to briefly mention uh, some of the work I've done during my PhD on indoor air pollution in uh, London schools. So this is an older building, it's a Victorian school, and uh, it's, a, it's close to a main street. And this is a, a contemporary building uh, farther away in a, in a background area. And what we've seen is we see very different characteristics on um, uh, in the air pollution profiles of the two buildings. This one has higher NO2 levels because they because they are produced locally and then they infiltrate indoors because the building is very leaky. This one has has much lower NO2 levels, and as a result, the um, um, uh, sorry the asthma prevalence in the school is like 10 times higher than the asthma prevalence in the other school. And while this might um, um, cover some other health inequalities between the two groups of children attending the school, I think that school exposure is quite significant in these outcomes. So now moving on to some palm data, they've been collected um, uh, um, over a week. So we have one participant here, the palm data are in blue. You can see there are seven spikes and they probably reflect um, cooking events. We collected this data in China and um, the red line are the um, outdoor uh, uh, monitoring stations that is very close to the participant's home. Uh, so we see the same features that we saw in the simulated data. So CO and NO at these time scales can be considered inert. We see a distinctive spike that decays over time and reaches outdoor concentrations. In the absence of sources, indoor equals outdoors, and both for NO, but then when we look at NO2, then or ozone or PM2.5, they're all reactive lower indoor levels in the absence of, source, of sources and much faster decays once a source has been introduced. So I'm, I hopefully convinced you that far that personal exposure um, is, does not equal outdoor exposure. And because we spend a lot of time indoors, it might be more correlated with uh, indoor air quality. And the reason for this big discrepancy are both the activity patterns, but also the modification effect of the, of the building characteristics. Shall I take these questions now? I see that there are three questions in the chat, or shall I wait uh, to take them later? It's entirely up to you. You can see what the questions are um, and take them now, or we can do a, a longer question session at the end. Okay. Um, okay, I'll, um, I don't know, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll have a look. So I guess there's nothing specific to... Yes, okay, okay, slide. I will so take them, them the yeah, I will take them to the end, thank you. Great, thank you. Yes, so, so now um, another concept that I, I would like to introduce is the importance of the time activity model. So what we do is we have input, input parameters that we collected from the PAM. Uh, here is the example of the road GPS data collected in, in the China deployment. You see uh, as the participants went here and there. And uh, we use a mixture of um, artificial intelligence and rule-based models and so on to distinguish uh, the major um, environments uh, based on time use metrics and space use metrics. So we know when they've been home, other locations or transit. And then we further break down transit into modes of, of transport because 
As I've said earlier, it's important for the physical activity levels. And we can in that way characterize uh, exposure and dose in a, in a very, uh, in, uh, in at high spatial and temporal resolution. And now I'm gonna bring um, um, an example of a deployment um, with a pump. Uh, it's just a time series. It's, it's the simplest example I could find just to illustrate this exposure and those um, issues. Um, he, he is a colleague of mine. He offered he offered to carry the pump for one week. So he is he lives here. He comes to work. He cycles about uh, on the weekend. He takes a bus. He goes to London. At the same time, um, is a time series of one of his representative work days. He sleeps. He comes. He cycles. He's at work just before nine. Uh, he cycles back home, he does a little bit of shopping, and he cooks and he sleeps, right? So what's really um, important is that his maximum exposure during his daily life, for example, to NO, happens while he cycles at a uh, rush hour. You can see here the accelerometer, you can see clearly when he's out and about. And his maximum exposure to PM 2.5 is when he's cooking. So this kind of short term events that affect personal exposure would do not have been captured with an outdoor network. So the only way to capture these things is with a miniaturized sensor that the person wears on them, it doesn't obstruct them and they get on with the day. And uh, so the, the inhalation rate, uh, I got this from the exposure handbook, depends on uh, who you are, personal characteristics. Are you a man or a woman? How old are you? Uh, how, uh, what's your weight? Uh, but also on the specific activity that you've been doing. So I, I estimate it us now in two ways for this one day. The first way is I take the pump concentrations and then I multiply it with a generic inhalation rate and I get this white bar. And the second way is I calculate the inhalation rate for, for my friend. And then I calculate the pump measurements um, and I multiply it with his specific inhalation rates for the specific task that he is doing. And now you can see that cycling, although a tiny fraction of his day, contributes significantly to his exposure. And the difference between taking into account the specific inhalation rates or using generic can affect the dose by a factor of almost two. So it's a massive difference that you need to take into account. So, uh, so personal exposure does not equal dose because physical activity levels are important. And now I would jump into the airless project and I'll try to explain to you how we use this, um, uh, the, these previous lessons uh, to address remaining uncertainties. So we recruited uh, 250 participants uh, in an urban site in Bezin and the peri-urban site just outside. Uh, we asked them to carry the palm one week in the winter, one week in the summer, and then we asked them to come to the clinic three times to take detailed measurements of um, biomarkers and other health outcomes. So here, for example, is one participant that has been trained to use um, a spirometer uh, for daily lung function measurements. And we take these um, so we, now we have an integrated database that we know exactly how much air pollution they've been exposed to. And we also know what are the specific medical um, outcomes. And then we try to run some statistical analysis to find the links between exposure and health, and more importantly, uncover the underlying mechanism of air pollution on health. The two cohorts were quite different. The urban one in Bezin uh, lives in high rise buildings. They have centralized uh, heating, a lot of uh, occupancy density. They are, um, uh, and uh, while the 
peri-urban cohort, they are mostly, um, they mostly occupy themselves with agriculture. Uh, so Pingu is very famous for some agricultural products like uh, peach and um, and some flower uh, chrysanthemum flowers and the the richest of these people here is a participant from the rural side coming to the clinic to the rural clinic and the richer of these people can can uh, use coal for heating and and cooking and generally for domestic energy use while the poorer ones we've noticed that they uh, use corn cob or generally any leftover waste that they can get their hands on and they can burn it and um, satisfy their domestic needs. And while we were there in winter, and you can see there is a, there's a paper on the characterization of this period, um, we had frequent haze episodes. So haze is uh, like increased the levels of some pollutants and particularly uh, PM. Uh, so they, they, it's a quite feasible event. In the summer, uh, we had very high levels of ozone. So we have a very different environment in winters and summers. So we collected the data and, and we analyzed them, we, we, cleaned, um, we cleaned the databases, we did everything we had to do, we applied the model, and now we look at their time budgets. They spend a lot of time at home, they spend as much as 90% in the peri-urban side, as you can see, the people in the peri-urban side do not cover such a large spatial distance as the people in the urban side, they're generally far more mobile. And then we looked at their diurnal patterns, so the, the, the most likely time that they would be commuting would be during the day. Now let's look at the doses of these people and please bear with me because this slide is a little bit complicated. So uh, I, I, we calculated those in two ways. The first way, A, there's a white bar, is what a standard epidemiological study would do. It would take ambient concentrations and then generic inhalation rates, because I don't know what you do, what this person is doing, multiply them, estimate what they've been exposed to. And then method B would be the refined method that we're trying to develop. So we know what you've been exposed to, we know what your activity, let's find out what your dose. And then we, when we compare it, we see a massive difference between the two estimations. So outdoor exposure does not, uh, outdoor measurements do not capture personal exposure. And what's even harder is that the, the, the extent of the misclassification changes between sites and it also changes between um, pollutants. So it's a very difficult, um, it's a difficult way to, to model this misclassification if you don't have a, a personal monitor. And finally, let's have a look what's happening in the UK. How does compares to the UK? So, here we have exposure of the airless cohort and we compare it against, so the solid is um, airless and the hatched one is the UK. And we collected this data during a pilot study with 35 participants uh, in London. And the, the first thing we see is obviously outdoor levels of NO2 in, in China were about three times higher than levels in the UK. And this is also reflected in the personal exposure. And the same for PM2.5, they are about 10 times higher. And see the same uh, difference, like proportionally, they have the same difference. Uh, so personal exposure will, to some extent, be affected by what's happening outside. But uh, what is uh, wildly different between the two locations is that um, the home in China is really a very um, unclean place in terms of air pollution, while in the UK, home is one of the lowest exposures. On the other hand, what I think is the mo another striking uh, result is that PM in the UK are generally very low, apart from the time that people go in the tube. And here we see quite high levels. 
And uh, this is because uh, these particles are produced locally by the wear and tear of the trains, and they are also resuspended by passing trains. And it's um, uh, it, it's also a, a very different chemical composition. Uh, it's um, it's very a metal rich um, particle composition. So um, in, the, in the UK, PM are disproportionately high in the underground. Now looking at the normalized dose, um, so I just normalized it so it's easier to compare because the differences are huge. And you can see that uh, because of the long time that these participants spend at home and also the high levels at home, uh, home is really, this environment really dominates their uh, dose. It accounts for more than 80% of the total dose. While in the UK, because home is much cleaner, we you can actually see the effects of commuting, particularly active, um, active commuting, such as, cyc such as cycling and walking. And um, uh, this is... Um, uh, or uh, or some or or also so for the other environment. So so yes, it ends up that commuting is important for the UK. So we did see these exposure errors um, between outdoor and uh, and personal exposures. Why is this important? And I'm going back to the graph I showed uh, earlier on in the presentation. So I selected one health outcome. Um, it's a, it's a C-reactive protein. It's just um, produced in the blood when there is inflammation. So it's, we hypothesize that the mechanism of air pollution on health is by, produ uh, by producing inflammation on um, on the body. And we used a mixed effect linear model. It's, I won't go into detail. It's imagine it's like linear regression. It's just a, a little bit more complex to account for, um, uh, for the fact that the observations are uh, independent, are not independent. So um, we run this uh, model and what we see is that uh, all pollutants seem uh, harmful to health apart from ozone. And, um, and we use ambient measurement. Now we do the same analysis to see what we could get with the PAM measurements. And now we see that NO2 is no longer significant. And that is, uh, that is exactly the point of this uh, exercise that we're doing. Now we are able to break the correlation between these two pollutants and therefore uh, improve our exposure estimates and reduce the bias that we get in health studies. Of course, it's concerning that ozone remains to have a beneficial effect on health. But as I've said, this is the zero um, thought model. And it's a standard way that the standard model that the epidemiological study uses. But um, I come to realize that now we have far more complex uh, data, both in terms of um, exposure. So we have very detailed exposure data. There are there is all this project. Uh, there is all this um, evolution in the fields of omics. So we can collect very detailed medical biomarker and the fact that that maybe this model is not enough. So my, what I'm doing right now is trying to develop better models with mathematicians and statisticians. Um, so to sum up um, about the, the personal monitoring, uh, what we've seen is that um, the, um, the, this exposure error is not innocent because it can, um, it can introduce significant error in health models. And this has also significant implications because as we've shown earlier on the presentation, depending on which pollutant is important and we're trying to tackle, 
then it might mean that we need different types of interventions and different scales of intervention. So we are hoping that this improved exposure um, methods and uh, more detailed health outcomes would provide uh, adequate guidance for policy. And to sum up what I've talked about today, firstly, I showed you what were the effects of the first lockdown on air pollution levels in London and um, uh, we and how we extracted this information from a low cost network uh, that it's been um, uh, with appropriate uh, methods for quality and assurance and how we can use modeling to evaluate in interventions and uh, that uh, that this kind of um, information are important to drive policy and I think that one of the most important outcomes of this project is uh, that we used London as a case study but we developed a methodology that's transferable in any setting and for the personal monitoring, um, I showed how um, exposure and activity um, are uh, necessary in uh, health studies and how we can achieve it even, um, even when we recruit hundreds of participants. And that assessing this kind of health effects during daily life is um, revolutionary in, field, in the field of epidemiology. And this improved understanding can really uh, improve uh, uh, the effectiveness of, uh, of interventions. And I would really like to thank my group. None of that would have been possible without the Rod Jones group. And on the left hand side, I put a picture of the APHH project that was that was the kickoff um, uh, of this project that airless was a part, it was a part in this very big uh, multidisciplinary project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah, for a fascinating talk um, covering such a wide range of um, data collection methods and data analysis. That was um, that was great. Uh, for anyone who has to head off um, now, please do join us for our next webinar in um, early July. Um, otherwise, Leah, if you'd like to take a look at the Q&A box, we've got some great questions coming in. And I also have a couple from the panellists that I can, uh, I can pass on. So Jill Thompson asks uh, two questions. First, at what scale was the meteorology and did lockdown affect the mit micrometeorology? Did this impact sensor emission and particle re recording? And also, can the um, PEM measure virus particles such as COVID? OK, metrology or meteorology is the first comment. Uh, it looks like metrology. Sorry, I, uh, uh, Jill, if you... measuring things, isn't it? Yeah. Metrology is the way that you measure things. Sorry, I don't understand the first question. Sorry. Okay, Jill, if you could uh, pop a clarification in the chat, that would be great. And in the meantime, uh, Simon Usher um, from Plymouth asks, um, if there are any chemical speciation measurements of PM 2.5 to give clues as to what the PM 2.5 material is in elevated periods. So what we try to do is we develop a method, a low cost method to uh, characterize the composition of the particles based on their hydroscopicity. But again, this is a, this, this is a very specialized question and it is work in progress that, that we do. Um, we um, and we can we can do some form of source apportionment with the methods that we uh, that that we develop. So so there's a question about the palm and you no know, the palm cannot measure virus particles and generally one of the biggest limitations of every optical 
um, a particle counter like all the OPCs, because all these low-cost technologies work with an OPC. So one of the limitations of every OPC, even the most expensive ones, is that they cannot uh, go, they cannot really detect ultra-fine particles, like anything that it's smaller than um, um, 0.3 or 0.1, it depends how good the sensor is. And therefore we kind of lose a lot of mass on this range. So when, uh, we, what we do is we, um, we try to extrapolate this mass that, that we lose. Uh, Thank you. Um, a question from, uh, from the, uh, the digital environment uh, team. What's the difference in terms of cost for manufacturing and maintenance of street level outdoor devices versus the personal sensors? Sorry, what is the? What's the difference in cost in manufacturing and maintenance uh, between the street level outdoor devices and the personal sensors? Oh, you mean like the, um, so shall I stop sharing? Yes. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, yeah, so uh, normally this kind of, uh, of reference uh, instruments, they cost, um, uh, it depends how good it is, right? Obviously, it can it can start for forty, fifty thousand pounds. Depends what it is, and the the palm, the the sensors of the palm, uh, everything included, is cost like six hundred pounds. So the difference is quite significant. Mm -hmm. What about in terms of maintenance? Maintenance do they each require? Uh, the the reference instruments uh, at least they, they need like uh, they often need calibration uh, cylinders and and gases and uh, for example when we were working in Bangladesh uh, where the resources are very limited the Department of Chemistry they are struggled to find the resources to buy this kind of cylinders from Germany right while uh, the low cost sensors the the most of the effort that you put, I think the most expensive um, part of it is the effort to develop these uh, post-processing um, algorithms because an instrument is only as good as its algorithm. That's true for any instrument. So, so generally I think that it depends on, on the environment the, the low-cost sensors can live for a few years. Um, we found, for example, that in a very dirty and dusty environment, the sensors tend to um, uh, they tend to disintegrate quite fast. For example, the OPC has got a, a mirror inside, so the dust deposits there and it start, stops being so reflective. So we saw the sensitivity of the instrument, the gain, like changing over time. So you need to consider this kind of limitations, but still, um, and, and there are many different costs in that sensors too, right? We are not really on the low cost sensor, we are on the lower cost. There are even sensors you can find today for particles that they get like, they cost like five bucks. So it's, uh, um, yeah. Um, a clarification um, from Jill Thompson that she did mean meteorology, not metrology. So Jill says in the first part of the talk, the weather was taken into account at what scale? After lockdown, the local ambient environment might have changed in addition to the emissions. How did this affect the models? The model takes into account the meteorology. That's what the DMS does, the dispersion. So. Um, and how how was that um, how was that meteorology obtained? Is it at the same scale as the sensors? What what um, what met stations do you, do you use? Ah, what's the details of the model? How how um, how does it get the weather into the model? Um, I am not sure. The, the ADMS is a, is 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 a is a commercial uh, software. I I I I can't I could not answer mm -hmm. that. Great. Okay, so Jill, yeah, please do get in touch with uh, with Leah if you if you'd like more. With the CERC, the, the CRC, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so the the second part of the question: after lockdown, the local ambient environment might have changed as well as the emissions. So not just the the emissions, but themselves, but actually how the you know how the streetscape has has changed. How do you think that may have affected the model? Um. 
Uh, how would the street streetscape change? Uh, I'm just I'm I'm again, Jill. Sorry, I'm interpreting your question uh, potentially badly. So the local ambient environment. I'm not quite sure what um, what Jill might mean by that. Okay. Um, uh, how um, I think that. Um, Sorry, can you repeat it? Sorry, that's <laughs> it's fine. So after lockdown, the local ambient environment might have changed in addition to the emissions. How did this affect the models? Again, that might be one to, uh, to talk about later if, uh, if the- Sorry, I, 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 it's not clear to me. No problem, no problem. So yeah, Jill, please do send Leah an email and you guys can uh, can arrange to talk offline. Um, Next question from uh, from Simon Creer, um, who enjoyed your talk very much. What evidence is there that elevated levels of NO2 in London is impacting human health? Do people die prematurely or have high levels of respiratory disease in London? And how important is bioaerosol co-exposure in models in relation to respiratory disease? Uh, I think that um, um... From 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 the work I've done, and it it agrees with what other people have found, is that especially for children in schools, the only important pollutant was NO2. So the issue now is that I don't know if it's NO2 directly that affects his health outcomes, and I, I don't think it's clear to anyone. Um, is is NO2 because it's primarily emitted by traffic. As it might be a proxy for any traffic related pollutant that can be emitted with that. Um, I have looked a little bit of um, on bioaerosol, um, but not not in my current so previously. And it, it looks like that um, um, uh, the air pollution makes the effect of the aerosol even stronger. So living in a polluted environment makes you even more susceptible to viruses and allergens and all the things that you would be able to deal better in a cleaner environment. Uh, but, uh, but again, all of these are open questions, right? Still, uh, the, the evidence of NO2 is not clear. And also in my work in Cambridge, I worked with a COPD cohort in London. So we, we monitored um, people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease for many years. And we found two, three years. And then we found that the exacerbations were mostly attributed to NO2. Um, again, um, as I've said, the limitation is whether it's a causal link or not. So there's a lot of effort being towards this direction, doing more detailed measurements. And so one of the things I'm trying to do, and I haven't I haven't included that in this talk, is uh, trying to use some pollutants as proxy for more detailed measurements. So in collaboration with people that do detailed chemistry. Uh, can I guess what other pollutants are co-emitted just by using emissions, emission indices in the same way that you would do it for the outdoor? Can you do it for the personal exposure? So th this is this is the next step I'm taking, trying to break down uh, total exposure into indoor, outdoor, and what are the ratios of different pollutants and what can you derive out of it? Thank you. It's really interesting to hear kind of what, what the, the next stage is. And I guess following on from that, another question from the, the Digital Environment Panel. Um, do you see a role for, for citizen science within this kind of one? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that the biggest thing we can do with that is um, uh, do the, uh, um, in, be involved in the outreach and empower people and empower communities. And uh, for example, one thing we could do is deploy this kind of uh, low cost sensors in schools. CO2 in schools is important, PM is important, especially taking into account the current challenges that, that we're facing. Um, CO2 can be a proxy for uh, your probability of getting an infection. Um, so there is the Wells-Riley equation that it that it uh, it 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 can directly um, uh, associate CO2 levels 
probability of viral infection. So we, we, we could do that, like deploy this kind of sensors in schools, empower the people, learn about their exposure, reduce, um, uh, reduce their probability of catching um, uh, infections. I think that, that there is a great, uh, great opportunity. And um, uh, yeah, and also big data is a part of it, how you would share this feedback at real time, how you would enable, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a whole other subject, you know, yeah, I'm sure yeah, we'll give a whole talk yeah. on, on how you process your data. And I, I'd yeah. love to find out more about that, but I think we're yeah. probably coming to the end. Um, there's just what, one final question from the panel. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the cost of one of your sensors versus one of the um, uh, standard monitoring sites. What do you think the comparison is in the worth of one super calibrated sensor versus lots of sensors at coarser resolution that maybe aren't quite as, as accurate? Mm, that's an interesting, of, that's yeah, a very interesting data. question. Yes. Well, lots of lots of less high quality data versus uh, smaller numbers of very high quality data. That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant question. I think that both approaches are valid. It depends what you want to get out of it. Yeah. yeah. It might be, for example, for citizen science, you don't need the super uh, calibrated down to the PPP levels as we do. So now with the, with, the, with the calibrations we do, we can get it down to the two, three PPP level. Maybe you don't need that. 10 PPP might be fine, no? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that that brings us on very nicely to some of the uh, the other questions that we'll we'll be addressing in the webinar series. You know, what what is the resolution that you need? What is good enough? Yes, yeah, what's exactly. good enough? Yeah. Okay. Well, with that, uh, I think we should draw the uh, the webinar to a close. Thank you so much, Leah, for your contribution. That was a fascinating talk. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. And please do join us again at the beginning of July for the next talk by Professor Jane Hart.